Saul over his wife, Pescom Fazi, children, and slaves. And, and the whole household. Uh -huh. The culture and the background of this passage is, is written in such a manner that in Roman society, women were not slaves, but they were freeing themselves. And in the name of freedom, they were sleeping around with married men and single men and became temples of prostitutes. Wow. And so the men or husbands were in such a way that they were worshiping deities. And one of the deities was the feminist god of Artemis. And one of the other gods were Diana. And the husband were cross-dressing wow. and making their voices high-pitched in order to impersonate women and marriages were corrupt and the temple goddesses amen and the temple goddesses were promoting sexual impurity. And so in public life, they were promoting bad sex they were promoting sex that was ungodly and they were seeking ways to fulfill their ungodly pleasures and so this was prominent in the city of Ephesus and so Paul knew this. Therefore, he seeks to give the Christian believers at Ephesus a standard or a godly standard that they may follow that will counter the world that was around them. And when he writes this passage, he's not writing in a specific for a specific incident that was going on in the Ephesian church. But he does not want them to be influenced by the world around them. He does not want them to follow the pattern of the society around them. So he gives them a pattern to follow so that they won't be like the world around them. And my brothers and my sisters, if you are in a godly marriage, if you are in an ungodly marriage, you ought to come out and not be like the world around you, but allow God to influence your marriage. Because marriage is important. Because marriage represents Christ and the church and as Christian leaders and as Christian believers 
And as Christian men, and as Christian women, we ought to want our marriage to glorify God. Amen. And so, and so Paul writes about the marriage relationship that there's going to be a lasting and healthy marriage. There must be at least three things. There must be reciprocal submission. There must be real sacrifice. And there must be a righteous standard. And so this verse, these verses link up to the previous verses. Because Paul had been sick, been talking about singing hymns in the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. And then he also talks about submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so he carries this idea over into verses 22 and 23. And he says, wives, wives submit to your own husband. The word submission here is not a, as the secular world would have it. But in Paul's day, submission meant to line up under. This, this is not to say that women were to be slaves. Women were not to be walked over. The word submission here, hupotase in the Greek, means to arrange under to get in order. It's a compound word. Hupo means under. Tasso means arrange. And remember the worldly marriages in Paul's day were out of order. Yeah. And, and, and this word is written in the command voice which means it's not up for debate. It is voluntary submission but it is a command to submit. But it's also in the middle voice which means if you obey it you reap the benefits of your obedience. Amen. Amen. So Amen. Roman women and the worldly women of Ephesus were freeing themselves from marriage relationships. And so men were sometimes uh, having a heavy hand they were ruling the women with a heavy hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so watch this, worldly marriages were out of order. Yeah. So Paul is given a guideline that marriages can be helped and they can be lasting and healthy. He does not want Christian marriages to resemble those heathens and non-Christian marriages around them. So he says if marriages are going to last, they must be from being out of order and become in order. Oh there must be reciprocal submission. The word reciprocal just means mutual back and forth submission. Everyone in the relationship is submitting. If there is no submission, 
there is chaos. Why? chaos. Paul says, wives, Why? submit to your own husband. This means submit to the leadership that God has provided through your husband. You say God gave him to you? Then when you stood before God and made a vow, you were saying that I'm going to obey God in my marriage. It means to submit to the leadership that God has placed over you in the person of your husband. And let me say this, ladies. This is why you have to be careful who you marry. This is why you got to be careful who you give your hand to and your heart to because not everyone is capable of leading you in the name of God. You have to be careful who you want to spend your life with because not everyone can provide you with spiritual leadership. And they, and they watch this. It does not care if you make more money than your husband. You're supposed to submit to his leadership. If you're going to have a lasting and healthy marriage, submit to to his leadership. Let me say this to you. Paul is not telling the wives to follow the husband's leadership blindly and foolishly. But he's appealing to these women to be willing to follow their husband's leadership. In other words, don't follow him, follow him off of a cliff. <laughs> don't follow him into a trap or into a ditch or into ruin. Don't follow him in ungodliness and in unrighteous acts because the ultimate goal is to please God. And let me say to the husbands, don't lead your wives into ungodliness. Oh, if you care for her, lead her in righteousness. Wives, God wants you to make a voluntary choice to submit to your husbands. But if you, if you submit in God's word to your husbands, you will reap the benefits. 